Right. We are now live. So welcome this afternoon to the meeting of the planning committee. And I uh, remind members uh, that uh, this is uh, a public meeting, as was a meeting in the uh, chamber, and uh, that all notes are recorded. So we move to the agenda, which is item one, the declaration of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Howarth, you wish to speak? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I need to declare an interest because I've been uh, assisting residents and giving views on uh, item three, which is 06551 stroke 19. Uh, that's my declaration. And I also need to add that um, when I've spoken as a ward councillor today, I will be withdrawing from the Microsoft Teams meeting and cancelling myself out of it. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, Councillor Sanders. Thank you, Chair. Yep, uh, the same application number 06551 slash 19 on Plodder Lane Farmworth. Um, I will not be taking part in committee during that application. Um, I too have had uh, discussions with relatives of neighbouring properties, um, so it's only right that I leave this virtual meeting at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, those declarations are noted. Item two on the agenda, urgent business. There is nothing which has been brought to my attention at this time. So we go to item three, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies, uh, Mrs Ridge? No, Chair, we haven't got any apologies. Uh, thank you. For the benefit of visitors, there are a number of introductions that uh, I just need to uh, give. I'm John Walsh and I'm Chairman of the Planning Committee for this uh, municipal year. Councillor Ayub is the Vice Chair. We have with us uh, Alex Allen, who is the Development Manager, Nicola Raby from the Legal Department, and Vicky Reid from Democratic Services. In attendance also are Martin Mansell and Jody Turton, who are Planning Officers, who will be presenting uh, reports during the course of this meeting. And the Borough Solicitor, Ellen Gorman, is also in attendance. Item four on the agenda, are the minutes of the previous meeting. These have been circulated. Are members happy that they're a correct record? If you disagree, would you please indicate via the chat box? Otherwise, right. someone move them as a correct record. Chairman, I move them as a correct record. Uh, thank you. Councillor Allen has uh, seconded that uh, via the chat box. All members in agreement? No dissent, thank you. We come then to the major items on the agenda, which is item five, the reports from the director of place. I need to explain to the benefit of visitors that we will be taking the reports in the order in which they are in the bundle to members. The process will be that officers will introduce the applications in detail and will then invite a ward councillor if they wish to speak for up to five minutes. There will then be an opportunity for an objector for up to three minutes, and then to take any questions, followed by a supporter who can also speak for up to three minutes and take any questions. Members will then be able to ask questions to officers and the matter will then be open for debate. I need to explain on all applications, members have got the benefit of a bundle containing late representations and the bills will be referred to by the officer at the presentation stage. Following uh, the, this debate, I will take whatever motions are presented and we will then take a vote. The first application is the land bounded by Blenheim Road, St Osmond's Drive and Breakmit Drive. And Ms Turton, I believe you are dealing with this uh, matter. Thank you, Chair. Just waiting for the uh, red box answer. Um, the application site is the former St Osmond's Primary School and is allocated as housing land within the Council's allocations plan. 
The principle of residential development on this site has therefore already been established. All houses are proposed at two storeys, whilst the apartment building, which will sit at the head of the cul-de-sac, is proposed uh, at three storeys. However, when viewed from Breakmet Drive, it would have the appearance of being two storeys, as the site is approximately four metres lower than the level of this road. The housing allocation for the site identifies it as being able to accommodate 41 dwellings. The proposed 40 dwellings are therefore considered to be appropriate. The council has received seven objections to the proposal and one letter of comment. The concerns raised in these letters are reported within the annex of the officer's report. Uh, they're mainly focused around design of the development, the increase in traffic in the area and the impact on the amenity of neighbouring properties. A previous planning application for the residential development of the site was refused by the council in April 2008 and subsequently dismissed at appeal. The site layout of this previously refused scheme is attached to the back of the officer's report. The inspector dismissed the appeal solely on design grounds, finding that the straight cul-de-sac with tightly sited houses would result in an impression of overlong unre unrelieved facades. He also found that the apartment building whilst three storeys could be acceptable, the previously proposed two blocks because of their joint bulk and repetitive fenestration would appear bland and monolithic. The proposed development now before members differs from the refused development in a number of ways, which are reported within paragraph 33 of the officer's report. Officers consider that the concerns of the inspector have been sufficiently addressed and that the proposed layout, scale, amount and design of the proposed development would be compatible with the character and appearance of the area. With regard to other matters, the 36 trees along the boundaries of the site are protected by a, a TPO. The proposal would result in the loss of some trees as detailed in paragraph 40 of the officer's report. However, the council's tree officers have confirmed that these are all category C trees and therefore do not object to their loss. Additional tree planting is also proposed to mitigate for these losses. The council's highway engineers have raised no concern regarding highway safety or the proposed level of car parking within the development. Um, and it's important to note that the uh, inspector in the previous appeal did find no substantive evidence that the residential development of the site would either harm highway safety or the local road network. Um, all interface distances between the proposed dwellings and existing neighbouring houses far exceed the council's minimum interface standards. As the proposal is for over 14 dwellings, there is a requirement for the applicant to provide planning contributions through a Section 106 agreement. The contributions required are listed at paragraph 71 of the report. The applicant has, however, submitted a viability assessment with their application, which concludes that the proposed development is unable to support any Section 106 contribution based mainly on the abnormal costs associated with the site significant level changes, drainage and contamination, and the low values of properties in the area. With the contributions, the development would make a loss of about 9.7%, and without any contribution, it would only make a profit of around 5.6%, which is far less than the benchmark return of 18% of GDV. The viability of the scheme has been reviewed by the council's viability consultants who agree that the given, uh, sorry, who agree that the proposed development is un unable to support any contributions. Given the low level of developer profit, a section 106 for a clawback clause is not considered necessary in this instance. Members are recommended to approve this application subject to the suggested conditions. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Councillor Walsh, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, we have no ward councillors indicating they wish to speak, nor an objector. The next person, therefore, to speak will be Ellie Philcox, who is speaking on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm Ellie from KPS. I'm the planning agent um, on this application. I don't have anything um, particular to say. I just wanted to thank the planning officer for their comprehensive report, um, which I don't have anything to add to. 
Um, but I just wanted to make myself available in case anybody had any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Any members for questions to uh, Mr Silcox? No? Well, thank you very much indeed. We c thank you for attending uh, in that case. Uh, we now come to question to officers and I've got an indication from Councillor Hornby. Yes. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, a question to Geordie, really. Uh, concerns that this is yet another application which is coming before us with regard to a non-contribution of Section 106. Uh, can I have assurances that um, we will definitely be following this all the way through to ensure uh, that um, whether or not a Section 106 can be uh, clawed back at a later stage. And the, and the other question is in, is in relation, the objectors, as indeed when the original uh, application came in, their concerns was the traffic. Can you confirm that there were, will, will or will not be less traffic with this development being there than there would have been had the school still been present on that site? Thank you. Ms. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the first question was with regard to the Section 106. So um, the officer's recommendation is that due to the incredibly low um, profit value from this site, um, that it, a, a clawback clause um, is not required via a Section 106. However, that is up to members. If members feel that they would be more comfortable with a Section 106 for a clawback clause, that is something that could definitely um, be, the, we could definitely speak to the um, applicant about that. Um, on the second matter, which was in terms of the traffic impact. So the original application that went to appeal and was dealt with on the site was for um, in excess of 50 dwellings and the highways agency at that time and the planning inspectorate did not consider there to be any um, severe harm to either to the highway network and therefore the appeal was not supported on on that basis um, and again the the current application highways do not feel that the the impact on the highway from the the, the dwellings would be severe um, to be able to justify that as a, as a as a reason for refusal and in fact given that there was a school on the site, which we all know there are very intense times in the day which a school site will experience quite um, high levels of traffic. Um, it's unlikely or that um, this development would have any greater impact than, than that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further question? Sorry, Kazal, but do you have a further question or are you happy with that reply? Uh, I'm happy with that reply, uh, Chair. Thank you. There are no further questions noted, so we come then to the debate. Uh, Councillor Peel. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I thought uh, Councillor Hornby's question was pertinent uh, and I thought he would have had a follow up uh, after what Ms Turton said about clawback clause. I, I'm, I'm presuming from that that um, a clawback clause would mean if we were to condition that, that should the profit margin be above um, our viability test, then section 106 could then be, um, be arranged. Um, I'd appreciate a, an answer to that question after I've concluded what uh, what I'm going to say. It's to me, it's um, it's a pretty straightforward application, <clears throat> um, underlined by the fact that the principle is there. It is allocated land for housing in a sustainable area of Bolton. Uh, we can't really compare it to the previously um, refused application 12 years ago uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there are less houses. Uh, even though that wasn't uh, uh, one of the reasons that the inspector dismissed the appeal. 
but the second reason we can't compare it is the inspector did dismiss the previously appeal uh, against refusal on design issues and um, the design and the layout of the scheme is considerably different uh, from, from last time as well as there being less houses. Uh, I am happy to move the application chair um, but um, I would appreciate just some clarification from Mr and about uh, the clawback clause. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peel. Mr, do you want to uh, respond to that, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, that is something that we we can definitely go back to the uh, the agent um, and have a section 106 drawn up um, with regard to a clawback clause, which would ensure that if the development, when built out, did make a profit over and above the 18% GDV, then um, we could recoup some um, of. Uh, of the contributions of the required contributions and that is something that we do often um, follow through on on applications um, in the current climate so that that's not a problem to go ahead with that I've made a note of it thank you chair thank you thank you uh, councillor Hornby <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm happy to second this application, uh, but again, do have some concerns with regard to this section 106. We could be setting a precedent here where uh, all follow up uh, applications in the current climate could uh, use the same excuse. And I think it's an insult to uh, residents in that area who have campaigned for so long with regard to a development being on that site. And, a section 106 it is a way of actually giving that community something back that where it can be spent in the locality. Uh, so I, I think we should pursue that uh, with vigour um, and see what we can see whether we can actually get that section 106 through. Like I said, seven objectors, that's less than last time, um, but uh, it's a site where uh, it desperately needs developing. It's in a it's in a nice location, or uh, quite close to Leaview Park, and uh, it will be an improvement on that corner, which is quite a, a substantial area. So I'm happy to second uh, this application. Thank you, uh, Councillor Allen. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm more than happy to uh, support this application. Um, it is allocated housing land. It is a far better application than many housing applications that we see in committee. The parking is uh, more than adequate compared with uh, with many others. Uh, my main concern, uh, as has already been expressed by other members, was the, uh, the 106 money. Um, it is becoming common practice now for developers to come back to the council and say we're really sorry but we can no longer afford to pay this 106 the viability isn't there uh, and i appreciate that that can be a genuine reason but we must be absolutely sure um, that that is in fact the truth so i welcome the introduction of a, a condition that revalues the profitability of this job by an independent valuer uh, at the end of the project and if indeed the profit is um, higher than was expected then I would expect the council to pursue at least some contribution especially the affordable housing element so apart from that I'm happy to support it thank you chair uh, thank you and councillor Darvesh thank you Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to support the application pretty straightforward. My concern, I, I concur with the feeling about the Section 106 agreement and we've seen it time and time again. I mean, we're all under a lot of pressure in terms of education, school places, and therefore, you know, we, we're very hopeful developers can make some sort of contribution. Uh, Chair, I think this may be strategic, but you know, when we, as, with the Council, allocate specific titles for land so land which is allocated for housing I, I i think maybe 
there should be a label on it from the outset to developers that this piece of land will require a section 106 contribution something like that at the outset i know it's a bit more strategic but something that says to the developer you know don't get your forensic accountants actually involved having a look at the sites because we're expecting some sort of uh, contribution from yourself so i'm happy to support the uh, application but we do really need to tackle the issue of the section 106. I think that's a policy matter that we need to take elsewhere, but it's noted, uh, Councillor Darvesh. Councillor Sherrington. I am here. I am here. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, all it is, um, uh, uh, because we've got these new houses going up and they've got these parking spaces that are part of the development, I was just wondering whether this would be a good time, seeing so, you know, that they feel that they're so poverty stricken that they can't go to any one or six, whether they could actually, uh, as part of putting in the electrics within the houses, if they could put on a, a charging point outside for people with, uh, with uh, uh, electric vehicles. And I think that the, this is an opportunity. And uh, whereas when, uh, this would come into effect that everybody would want them. Uh, you would find that you would have to do a lot of work on uh, sorting out the electrics to do that. Whereas if they do it as part of the house build, it might be very, very uh, good for selling their properties or whatever. So um, it's only a thought and uh, quite simply, um, I have no objections against this, uh, you know, I will be supporting it. However, I just think that these kind of situations, I do think that we need to, as an authority, start looking at putting this down like we do, like I did with the bins, you know, nowhere I'd add anywhere to put the bins now. It's something that they look at when they sort out the planning permission. Is uh, I was just wondering whether this is one of those that needs to be looked at, that it goes on as an automatic. But possibly, like you've just said earlier, you know, it's probably a policy thing. It's probably got to come to a policy meeting, and that's probably something that I'll look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hornby. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's just that uh, we, we, from from my memory on, on a previous application uh, in the west of the borough, I, I'm sure that we agreed that that would go and look at policy at a PDG at a later date because it, it is a thing for the future. And I think we we've agreed that we should set a precedence and be the first council in the in, in Greater Manchester to look at that. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that we've already done that. Thank you, Councillor Hornby. Councillor Wilkinson. Right, no. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just in relation to the report uh, around 106 agreements, I agree with the other members that um, uh, the 106 condition needs to be attached. However, I am concerned that we do get uh, reports on a regular basis, and I've done over the last couple of years, where developers come along and say, we can't afford anything, and officers include that in the report, but committee then has to tell officers, sorry, take that out of the report and put conditions 106 money back in in case there is a profit. Can we just not change that around completely? It might be a policy thing or even a simple instruction to officers. Don't put that in. Keep the clause, the 106 clause, and uh, review it, uh, the development uh, funds uh, money, which is available from the development at the end instead of keep us coming backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Uh, to the public, it, view, it looks like we're doing things at the behest of the developer instead of the planning system and our local communities. Thank you. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think a number of good points have been raised uh, by the committee so far. Um, I don't mind supporting the application like everybody else has said. 
But when it comes to 106 money, surely with such a size of development, there must be a certain amount of money, even if it's a small amount of money that the develop developer can put back into the community. And I think it's something really important that we need to look at in the future as well uh, with other applications that are coming in. We can't uh, so we can't simply afford to let developers uh, work, develop schemes of this size without putting anything back into the community, whether that's for health or education. That's a, you know, a different question. But I don't, like I said, I don't mind supporting the application, like most people have said. However, we do need to look into this um, issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Councillor Darvesh, you wish to speak again? Yeah, yeah, Chair, just a quick one. Uh, New builds, um, do they automatically not have PD rights removed in them? For, what I'm saying is it's not a condition. I've not noticed in any, as a condition that the PD rights have actually been removed. Could be a question for, for Jody actually. Question for officers. Jody Turton, do you wish to comment on that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking through the conditions at the moment and no, um, permitted development rights have not been removed for this um, development. Was there something specific that Councillor Darvesh um, had noted that he would want um, to permit a development rights to be removed for and then we can, I'm, I'm happy to look at that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Darvesh. So, sorry, Chair, I thought it was um automatic on new bills that they couldn't have PD. So it just stops people from, you know, doing a variety of massive extensions at the rear. I thought, I thought it was just automatic. I mean, there's no specific reason. I thought we put them on all new builds. That's what I'm thinking. OK, thank you. I think that comment is noted. Is the uh, council appeal your, you moved approval? But if that section 106 issue is to be included, presumably your resolution would be that it should stand uh, delegated to officers. Councillor Peel. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> wait. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, so I have moved approval. Um, I think there's overwhelming agreement now that the claw, the clawback clause should be um, a condition in there. Um, Councillor Wilkinson had an interesting idea, didn't he, about, about that being the the, uh, the standard way of doing it in the future. And I think that is something that we should look at. Um, I, I understand the legal advice is that um, with, such a, with such a clawback clause now uh, going on as a condition, the um, application would be delegated to the director uh, in order for those um, those details to be to be worked out. So I move that it's delegated to the director. Thank you, Councillor Peel. Uh, Mr. Allen, you wish to speak? Alex Allen. Hi, uh, sorry, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. It was just coming back on the issue of permitted of our rights. I think uh, I've seen in the chat, Paul's mentioned that we, we only explicitly restrict permitted of our rights where there's uh, circumstances which require it. So, for I suppose, like this example, if, for example, a, something, an extension which could be built from the permitted development which would harm a protected tree. That was potentially one reason why we could restrict PD rights. Or, for example, if the if the gardens are quite very small and obviously a permitted development extension would take up the whole of the back garden, for example. Um, and also just to reassure members that we do, officers do spend a lot of time um, looking at 106 um, viability issues. Uh, and yeah, taking Councillor Wilkinson's point on board and Councillor Peel's point about um, making sure we include that within the description of committee items in future. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Walsh, you're on mute. Don't know that happened. Apologies for that. The uh, proposal, therefore, that most of us vote on is that the matter be delegated to the director uh, for determination of the detail of the 106 agreement. You're voting for or against that motion. Mrs Ridge. Thank you, Chair. It's Helen Gorman. I'm going to help out with taking the vote on this one. Thank you. Um, so just to confirm, Councillor Walsh, that the motion before committee is to delegate to the director to complete the legal formalities. And members will remember that it is a vote for, against or to abstain. Um, so Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Ayub. For. Councillor Connor. For. Councillor Darvesh. For. Councillor Dean. For. Councillor Howarth. For. Councillor Hayes. For. Councillor Hornby. For. Councillor Mystery. For. Councillor Peel. For. Councillor Radcliffe. For. Councillor Sanders. For. Councillor Sherrington. Councillor Sherrington. It's all right, I'm on mute. Sorry about that. Four. Thank you. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Waters. Four. Councillor Wilkinson. Four. Councillor Wright. Four. So that's 17 in favour of the motion. The motion is therefore carried. And thank you for that, members. We will move then to the land at Manchester Road, but we need a brief pause whilst uh, Mrs Ridge lines up uh, the uh, supporter of this application. I remind members that we are still live streaming this meeting. Chair, the supporter has just been admitted into the meeting. Thank you. All that. So, can I can I remind members to turn off uh, and mute their microphones when they're not speaking, please? We come now to the land at Manchester Road, South Manchester Road. At page 26 in the bundle. I think Mr. Mansell, you are presenting uh, this application. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, consent is sought. Uh, to erect a vehicle showroom with ancillary servicing and valet uses with cars displayed around the site. The main building would be. Apologies, one second, somebody's trying to phone me and I'm going to make sure I turn my phone off. I'm going to start again, Chair, apologies for that. Um, That's all right. Consent is sought to erect a vehicle showroom with ancillary servicing and valet uses with cars displayed around the site. The main building will be 7.8 metres high with a flat roof and finished in cladding with extensive areas of glazing at the front. It will be between 32 and 38 metres from the frontage of the residential properties on Kersley Drive. A total of 165 vehicle spaces are proposed, the majority of which will be used for displaying cars for sale although the plans also show 16 car parking spaces for customers with staff able to use the extensive vehicle storage and parking area at the rear. The applicant states that the proposed Volvo dealership is a brand new addition to Bolton and is not a replacement of an existing facility. As a result, the dealership will create a, num uh, a number of new job opportunities for the Bolton area, specifically 13 sales jobs, 18 service jobs, 
six administration jobs and five driver and valet jobs, resulting in 42 new jobs. The applicant also wishes members to be aware that the scheme would generate new jobs during the construction phase. A landscaping scheme is proposed to soften the appearance of the site when viewed from Kersley, Kersley Drive and to some degree mitigate the harm caused by the loss of the trees which were subject to a condition uh, on a previous uh, consent that they be protected during the demolition uh, of the office block that was previously located within the site. The landscaping scheme includes the retention of the existing dwarf wall along the boundary with Kersley Drive together with the planting of 13 trees uh, and an evergreen hedge which once established would be maintained to a height of 1.5 metres. Objections have been received from three properties on Kersley Drive together with a petition received by the local MP and signed by 15 local residents. The grounds of objection chiefly relate to the fact that the impact of this development will be exacerbated by the removal of the trees last year um, uh, which was contrary to an imposed planning condition uh, and they also raised significant concerns over excessive lighting. However, planning officers and pollution control officers are in agreement that subject to appropriate conditions, car sales and residential uses can exist comfortably together. Um, and Manchester Road also contains a number of examples along its length, um, including the new Audi dealership at the former Manchester Road College site, which has the residential properties of Grosvenor Street facing its side boundary. Turning to the late list, you'll see that officers are confident that the, relative, rele, the relevant statutory consultation has been carried out in full, including letters posted directly to all properties on Kersley Drive and that a site notice has been posted and the 21 day period has been allowed to expire before the application was brought before members. You'll also see that the applicant expresses significant concerns over two of the recommended conditions. Whilst I think they are relatively comfortable with the condition that all activities be limited to be between 7.30 a.m. and 8 p.m., they argue that ceasing the servicing element at 5 p.m. is likely to lead to Volvo walking away from the development, investing elsewhere, and therefore that the economic and employment benefits would not take place. They also argue that the lighting should not be restricted outside of operating hours in order to, um, so that they can enhance the security of the site and the prominence of their offer. Pollution control colleagues are our technical consultees on these issues as they are the council's first responders for complaints relating to noise and to light pollution. Following discussions on these issues, planning officers and pollution control officers are entirely in agreement that we do not presently have sufficient information before us to give members the confidence that those restrictions should be relaxed or not be imposed. Um, we are mindful of the risk to the economic and employment benefits, but on the basis of the evidence before us today, we cannot agree to those uh, requested changes to the conditions that are recommended in the report. That's not to say we cannot envisage being able to do so in future, perhaps via future well supported application to vary this condition, including perhaps much more greater details on the servicing element assessed by a noise consultant, perhaps a much more nuanced lighting scheme that allows for some, but not all of the lighting to operate overnight overnight but that is not where we are at this point in time so subject to the hours and lighting restrictions recommended in the officer's report we do recommend that members approve the application thank you chair thank you uh, mr mansell i have no indication that a ward member wishes to speak uh, we do have representations from objector rachel Ivel. Uh, who is not uh, able to be with us today, but her statement will be read by Mrs. Ridge. Thank you, Chair. So this is on behalf of um, Rachel and Nick Ivel and Muriel Davis. We are writing to object to the above development proposal. We have lived on Kersley Drive since 2012 until recently, our street bordered with an unobtrusive office building lined with mature trees and bushes. The building was used only during office hours. The greening was a much appreciated oasis living near the very busy Manchester Road, which is now being further industrialised and made even busier. A few years ago, the planning department argued the need for affordable residential dwellings in and around Kersley Drive, for example, on the Woodland site and currently the former Beehive Mill site. The Woodlands has been developed and the Beehive Mill site is now in the process of being developed into houses. It seems that there has been a turnaround on this thinking and we could be forgiven for thinking that there is a hidden agenda 
to turn our area into some kind of strip mall on a major route into the town. Clearly, this is at the expense of small residential streets like ours. The developers cleared the mature trees that bordered us completely last year, even though they were meant to stay. It seems clear that if their roots were interfering with the United Utilities underground work, this would have been dealt with long ago, as they have had an interest in looking after their assets for years as they were the previous site owners. We are deeply concerned about the planting plan, which will not be enforced as it, it wasn't on the woodland site where no screen was ever planted. The planting plan will take a while to mature and will remain at low level, not giving residents the shield from lighting and a more obtrusive building. The building is higher and will be much more illuminated by definition of being a car showroom. We would like the lighting scheme to be considered at the same time as the rest of the application rather than be deferred as the reserve matter again. Again, from our experience with the woodland site, reserve matters are not allowed the public scrutiny that the long-standing residents of Curzon Drive so deserve. We are concerned that the stipulation should be made at the planning meeting. It concerns us that once again, as with the woodland site, work on the car showroom commenced at the end of May before the official green light was given by the committee. This further erodes our belief in the democratic process of planning. Finally, residents also object to the bus stop being moved to the other side of the gateway to this development because of this development. Transport for Greater Manchester have said that this was Bolton Council's decision and the council has said it was Transport for Greater Manchester's decision. Either way, it's us that we vote again. It's our children and elderly residents who now have no alternative but to cross a busy junction when using public transport instead of being able to hop on a bus at the end of the street. We hope that you can take our views into account as you make your decision. Thank you very much. Clearly we can't uh, question the objector. So we come to representative for the applicant, Matthew Wyatt. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Brilliant, okay. Um, you have three minutes to address the meeting, uh, Mr Wyatt. Thank you. The proposed car dealership is set to be occupied by Volvo Cars UK. Um, it represents a three million pound investment in Bolton that will create 42 jobs across the sales and servicing elements. The, the group wants to be located here, uh, despite the hit that the car industry has taken over recent months due to the pandemic. Um, however, they've expressed the need confidence that the site can be made a success and security measures implemented. These matters are absolute deal breakers for Volvo. Uh, I've written to members this week to ask, uh, as Martin has explained, that condition 13 is amended to remove the reference to turning all lights off following closure. Lighting details submitted to date demonstrate extremely limited light spill onto residential streets, and based on the general industry standard, uh, this would be merely 16% of the maximum allowed in residential areas, so really dim. Uh, it, it, indeed, the dealership building will probably block light, I see it, from the adjacent 24-hour McDonald's, which was permitted by the committee last year. Um, more importantly, as uh, we're not uh, proposing massive ugly security fencing around the site, the lighting is essential for deterring crime, and Volvo will have to walk away, as has been said, uh, if they're not allowed to implement the security measures, because there's no way the, the stock will be covered by insurers. Regarding condition 14, um, it says Volvo can't accept open hours across the whole operation that are less than 7.30 till 8 Monday to Saturday and 10 till 6 on Sundays. We do feel that this is entirely reasonable, given especially how the committee report accepts that car dealership is a use that generally isn't noisy, but in this instance, disturbance would have to be considered against the existing high background noise generated along uh, the traffic along Manchester Road, railway lines, and other existing businesses, including those adjacent to the site with 24 hour opening. Again, I think mean, I think the Volvo dealership would serve to actually block much of the light from noise and cars visiting adjacent drive throughs uh, and, and the petrol filling station. The proposed amendments will give Volvo the required security and fighting chances it needs to succeed in the current economic climate. But if members are still concerned about these aspects, then I ask that the application is approved, but with matters deferred and delegated back to the planning department. I think uh, Volvo are unlikely to hang around and wait the outcome of, of applications or uh, appeals to vary the conditions, um, which uh, I think Martin stated but was his, his preference. Um, we, we just don't have the time on our side, I'm afraid. Um, finally, I mean, a, a, a lot of efforts going into the landscaping scheme along uh, Kersley, Kersley Drive. 
proposals are needed to follow the United Utilities guidance for planting and ensuring easements. And along this boundary, the scheme now includes 13 trees that have an initial planting height of up to three metres, which of course will grow and become established. These are located on a, on a banking, so the height will feel much greater. And we're quite confident that once it's developed, the scheme will bring back the levels of uh, levels of amenity uh, that have been mentioned by uh, the, uh, the lo local residents. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. White, you are coming to the end of your three minutes. Please, could you sum up? I, I'm, I'm just, uh, we're just saying, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the landscaping scheme, in my opinion, once it's established, will bring back that level of amenity that's been mentioned by the, the, the local residents. Um, I urge you to uh, approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, questions to the applicant, uh, Councillor Hornby. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, two questions, really, if, if, if I may. One is in relation to the concerns that residents have on Kersley Drive, because obviously we've had a, had a previous application where residents were concerned. Has there actually been dialogue from your architects and yourselves with Kersley Drive? That's the first question. And the second question is in relation to the threat to that if it's not approved today, that Volvo are likely to uh, pull out. Now, I accept that there's been a, a bit of a backlog with planning applications um, because of lockdown, but the committee are dealing with planning applications on a fortnightly basis now. So uh, would, if it was uh, in order for a couple of weeks or up to a month, would that affect Volvo's decision to um, to actually uh, pull out? Thank you. Um, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll take your uh, second question first, if that's OK. Sorry, it's always a bit of a rush when you've got three minutes limit to get everything in. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, Volvo um, are um, at a point where if, you know, if, if an application was deferred and, and, and delegated, then, you know, to, to resolve the, these just these outstanding matters. And and from, you know, from, from what St Martin's been explaining, we're very nearly there. We did submit lighting details and the um, uh, the environmental health officers just not had a chance to, you know, kind of fully review those and provide a, a detailed response. Um, the, it's the, the, the same with, with the noise um, before the United Utilities buildings were all demolished. There, there were background noise surveys undertaken for them, so sort of base recordings have been done. And I, I'm very confident that we could quite quickly turn something around to, to address those concerns. But it, it's, it's a case that um, I think if, if Volvo obtain a planning permission today with, with conditions on that would require them to apply to vary those and with no certainty as, as to the outcome as, as they would see it with appeals. You know, we were talking a minimum of eight weeks to the termination of an application and, and at the moment for a turn appeal, you know, you're looking, you know, at six to six to nine months. So, you know, they're, they're just, they're, you know, they're prepared to wait a month, but, you know, uh, uh, Wait, waiting, waiting the best part of the year is just unacceptable to them. So, um, what well, there is a rush, but there is time to get things done if we can agree to do it in, in, in the right way. Um, in terms of the um, uh, uh, speaking with uh, locals of Kays, the drive, no, I'll, I'll be honest and say no, we, we haven't had any direct correspondence with them. Um, however, the, uh, the, the 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 latest landscaping scheme which has been put in, I think mean, it says in the report, it's on the seventh provision now, and the landscape architects that we've appointed have worked really hard with the councils on landscape um, uh, uh, architect to uh, <laughs> ensure that we have potentially have the best scheme possible. Um, the, I think it, it was kind of touched upon, there is a, there's a sewer easement which, which goes all pretty much all the way around the site and on that boundary. So, and um, we've, we've got to adhere to very strict United Utilities guidelines in terms of what we can plant because uh, so you don't want roots and they don't want roots sort of penetrating the, 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 the sewer pipes. So it's, you know, it, it, it's pretty serious and, we've, you know, we'll be liable for, you know, costs effectively from, from United Utilities. But we, we, we said that the scheme that's, that's been put forward, you know, I think we're all happy with it. I appreciate there's, there's 
been a lot of anger and upset about the loss of those trees, and it was nothing to, to I suppose nothing to do with myself. But you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to look at the case on its individual merits and the scheme. I mean, it has it has said 13 uh, now trees that are, are, are up to three metres at, at, plant, at initial planting, and it's on the banking. So they should look a lot higher. So I, I think I'm very hopeful that whilst you know it'll take a couple of years for those trees to fully develop, um, you know the, you'll have a very very good planting scheme that that will you know that, that the residents will, will be happy with. Thank you, Mr. Wyatt. I have no indications of further questions. So thank you for your attendance this afternoon. Uh, we come therefore next to questions to officers. Uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Question may be for planning officers, or it may be for our uh, solicitor. Um, trees that were removed uh, illegally, it seems, before this application was submitted, did the council pursue legal action against the uh, the contractors? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, we haven't, no. Um, my, the approach that I've set out in my report was to try and um, mitigate the harm caused by that um, via, in the knowledge that an application was to be submitted on this site, was to do what we can to mitigate the, the impacts of that harm um, through the planning application process. Um, in, in my report, I expressed that um, we, we do need to be proportionate in how we we deal with enforcement cases and work positively if we can. And whilst members may reasonably disagree with the approach I've taken, the approach I've taken is as I've expressed it, which is to try to, to resolve the situation um, via um, getting the best landscaping scheme that we can on this site, um, rather than through legal process or enforcement notices. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Councillor Ayo, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I got the quest two questions actually. Uh, the applicant supporter. First one is: Have you had a look at any other site in Bolton? And the second question is: The removal of trees may have been taken before you. Are you able to confirm now that trees and hedges can be planted as soon as development is complete? I think, uh, I we, we've lost the applicant, but uh, perhaps Mr. Mansell could give a partial response to that. OK. Um, I, I, I can't speak on the point of whether Volvo have looked at any other any other sites. Um, what I could say about the planting scheme is the. The, the condition, the condition is our standard worded landscaping condition. Um, which requires planting to be carried out within six months of the occupation of the development. The six months is to allow for the fact that um, landscaping can only be pl planted at certain uh, at certain times of of the year. Um, I'm just noticing, noticing uh, Mr. Gorman is saying that the applicant's agent is, is still here. Um, if they want to respond instead of me, I'm happy to well, do that. Can you deal with the planting uh, process, please, first of all, Mr. Mansell? Yeah, I suppose I'll, 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 I'll just repeat what I said before, which is the so standard landscaping uh, condition, which requires planting to, to be done six months um, after the commencement of the use. Um, and that is limited by the fact that you can only plant uh, landscaping at certain times of the year. So um, we could look at wording that to minimise it, but we are somehow bound by the the fact that the, the planting can only take, take, you know, planting will not establish if you plant it at the at the wrong time of the year. There are there are natural restrictions on that matter. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mansell. Uh, sorry, Mr. White, if we could come back to you, if you can still hear me. Uh, hello. Yes, I, I can. Yes. The question uh, that was asked was, have you looked at any alternative sites in Bolton, or is this the only site that you have explored? 
Uh, well, this this is the only site that uh, we have. Well, that, that the applicant has explored. Uh, I mean, it's probably just worth understanding. Um, you know, the, the the applicant in this instance is not Volvo. Uh, it is a group called Monty Blackburn, who on the, the whole of this, uh, this this site, which has been subject to the, the demolition and uh, the, 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 the the other adjacent applications, um, and they have secured a contract with Volvo to you know who, who would effectively occupy this building so it would be constructed by the applicant uh, and and that but but no I'm I mean I would assume that before making uh, sort of a you know a three million pounds investment uh, into it from from Volvo um, they would undertake a lot of due diligence in terms of trying to look at the best available site. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Hornby, did you have a question for officers? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, it's uh, two questions, really. Um, uh, the first question is in relation to um, the boundary treatment at Kersley Drive. Obviously, it's very contentious that and was last time. Do we do do officers believe we've addressed everything that we can address with regard to that? And the second question is in relation to if the committee was minded to defer this application today, um, how soon could we get it back before this committee to finally make a decision? Thank you. Mr. Mansell. Uh, th th thanks, Councillor. Um, I, I, the way I've expressed in, in, in response to your first one and the way I've expressed that in my report is that um, I don't think we would we 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 will have satisfied the concerns of the local residents if that's what you uh, if that's if that's what your question is alluding to um it's clear that they're still objecting to it and continue to do so and have done so um, and i've done so, done so today uh, by mrs ridge what i could tell you is that i'm satisfied that we've done that the landscaping scheme maximizes the opportunities available if we if we we, we certainly accept the within the constraints of the United Utilities asset and the restrictions that United Utilities place on planting that, that they will permit within a defined area of their asset. So that's the one constraint. <clears throat> and, and that's a for me, that's an absolute certain constraint. There isn't any um, any leeway in that United Utilities reserve the right to remove anything that is planted um, if it's at risk of damaging their assets or is in contra contravention of their guidelines. Um, I'm satisfied that we've done the best, that, that we've maximised the opportunities in terms of the development before us, before us today. Further maximisation of landscaping would result in removal of car display spaces. So if we're to accept that those car display spaces are necessary to make the development acceptable for Volvo, then that is the best that can be done within those spaces. And um, the applicant has explained to us that if we, on a number of occasions, if we were to seek to um, reduce the number of display spaces on that side in order to increase maximum in, increase landscaping, that um, <laughs> I use the phrase that the, that the applicant uses, that would be a deal breaker for Volvo. <clears throat> well, thank you. A question from Councillor Howarth. Uh, f thank you, Chair. Um, I want to uh, ask Mr Mansell about condition 14, uh, which is clearing our uh, paperwork today. And then, of course, we've received um, a PDF email asking us to look again at two conditions. And But I just want to ask about condition 14, actually. Um, so uh, looking at the words and the differences, uh, um, it seems clear, actually, that the difference is the whole business of uh, the service centre. And uh, I'm asked to consider whether, uh, could it not be that the service centre gets the same hours of 07.30 to 8 o'clock in the evening? So it's that's longer hours for the service centre. I think if I've considered the two uh, um, side by side, um, can 
uh, Mr Mansell just explain a bit more why in his speech he did say that the way that condition 14 is written by officers is what officers are still remain. It's their conclusion that that is better. Can you just explain a bit further for me, please, why that should be the way that it is pertaining to the service centre? Thank you. Um, I, thank, thank you, Council, and thank you, Chair. I, I will try to do so. And, and after I've done that, I've realised I didn't come back on the second part uh, of Councillor Hornby's uh, question. So in terms of the, the hours that we're recommending, that's, um, that's based on discussions with pollution control officers. And it's based on a, I think it's fair to say, it's based on a limited amount of information that has been submitted by the applicant today in terms of the precise activities that would take place within the servicing area um, and the absence of a, of a, of a, um, a, a proper formal noise assessment um, that, 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 that that would, uh, in order to demonstrate the acceptability of, of the service in use um, into the evening. Um, Police Control's colleagues are very clear to me that had a formal, well, whilst they accept the principle of the development, they don't feel that a noise assessment is necessary to, uh, to demonstrate the, the principle of the development, but they do feel that had a noise assessment been submitted, they could have extended greater flexibility over and would have been more comfortable in, ac in accepting the hours that are proposed by by the developer. Um, I'm happy. I, I, I will turn to Councillor Hornby's question on the uh, in terms of how soon we can get it back to committee. I, I have to say we will always try to get things back to committee as soon as we possibly can, but it does depend on um, on on us reaching agreement with an applicant. And it seems clear to me that if members were to defer the application today, they would not want us to return to something that he, return an application to them unless that issue had been fully addressed in the way that members are, uh, uh, seems to me to be requiring. Um, so I would certainly exert every effort I can to get it to, to committee as soon as possible. But I think members would want us to make sure that, that we are in agreement on that. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peel, you had a question to officers. <clears throat> um, apologies, Chair. I'm, I'm waiting for the, uh, I think it's staying on you. Uh, no, I did, apologies, I did have a question, uh, but um, I think Mr Mansell's probably answered the bulk of it in, the, in his last reply. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, question to officers. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a couple of questions to officers. Uh, the applicant has made uh, play of the requirement for lighting on the site. Uh, I have to admit I'm not keen on um, developments with lighting such as supermarkets, etc. who have lights blazing everywhere, particularly large illumination signs. There's no need for them. People are asleep in the dead of night. Uh, so I think they should be turned off. We're talking about environmental issues, uh, in general, uh, pollution, and also for nearby residents. But I'd just like to ask on that, could we look if this goes forward, that the condition should be around uh, security lighting, not just lighting, uh, just for the convenience of Volvo. There are different methods of uh, having security lighting on sites, whether it's thermal uh, sensor lighting, uh, movement uh, detectors, etc., which will pick a human being up, not uh, um, a, a small cat or dog. Uh, the other question in relation to security is that the applicant made play of lighting for security. I, unless I've missed it, I can't find a police crime uh, issue on this uh, in this report. Uh, we're talking about vehicles uh, which may be worth something, uh, and the applicants made play of it, but I can't find any police um, response on, on crime issues. Other question is in relation, I think it's paragraph 71 and 70, 
in relation to surface water obviously we're having a large area of tarmac uh, is united utilities uh, happy with the uh, floor coming off this site um obviously it's got to go somewhere and the water retention tanks etc and the other one is a policy issue if i could ask uh, officers uh, we have a number of developments along the manchester road area and policy normally is town centres um, the valley uh, re uh redundant mills mill sites etc uh, but we don't seem to have a policy for manchester road which has developed into basically car sales alley and it is a um, bit of a letdown actually in policy terms and also how we deal with issues on manchester road in terms of traffic uh signage illumination the appearance of the road the streets etc uh, something could have been made a lot better because it appears we have no policy so we can't ask applicants to do things so those are my questions on uh, the moment thank you chairman uh, mr Vansell. okay and um, th thank you chair and thank thank you council i do i do count four questions there and i'm going to try and take them as best i can in turn i have to say some of that did seem like um I think it's fair to say, you know, comments and debate rather than questions. But I'll do I'll do my best to to respond to them. On the <clears throat> um, as far as I understood it, the question on lighting was: Would it be possible to make sure that the lighting only reflects security rather than um, maximising the prominence of the site in the Manchester Road scene? Um, I think that's probably a fair point, and I did I did allude to that <clears throat> I think in, in my opening remarks that if we were to accept a lighting scheme that that, that that operated on a 24 hour basis I think we would want to see that it was a much more nuanced scheme that that kept that to a minimum um, overnight in particular but that's that's not what we have before us at the moment um, we are recommending that the lighting ceases overnight <clears throat> and one of the reasons for that is the existing we think quite high background levels of lighting on Manchester Road. I feel it's a um, it's quite a well illuminated street at the moment. Um, in terms of crime, crime, um, it is true to say that a crime impact statement has not been submitted for this application. Um, we've chosen to deal with that on the basis that the site is reasonably well. Uh, it benefits from good natural surveillance and activity levels. It's it's fairly open, um, but we have imposed a condition that further details of um, so I think the way we're looking at it is we we accept it we, we consider it to be acceptable in principle in terms of crime reduction um, but we would want to see further details of the applicants uh, from the applicant in terms of lighting CCTV coverage um, locks etc and that then they would be subject to consultation with with Greater Manchester Police um, on the third point um, United Utilities at present do object to the planning to the planning proposal before you on the basis that certain certain issues with drainage on the wider site have yet to be resolved. And now we feel that they can be resolved. The water, as, as I think you pointed out, Councillor, the water is a, the water is going somewhere. Water that's rainwater that's falling on the site at present is going somewhere. Um, the question really is can more be done for that to be controlled in a sustainable manner so can it go to the dedicated surface water drain can it go to uh, a nearby water course could they ma maximize opportunities for infiltration we feel that that needs to be looked at on a site on a whole site basis um, this, whilst we're looking at individual applications here um, we need to look at the surface water drainage system um, on a site-wide basis and the approach we've taken on the other one is to reserve that issue to be dealt with via conditions and that's the approach that we're taking on here it's very difficult to look at the surface water drainage proposals for this site in isolation of the wider site and then on the last point uh, it was about Manchester Road in general um, I, I think it's fair to say we don't have a policy at present that picks up the issues that you've that, that you that you've raised there councillor 
hope I've done my best to respond to those questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mansell. I think um, Mr. Whittingham, who is the head of uh, development and regeneration, wants to come in on the issue of landscaping. Chair, I've actually had a question and I've, I've not been put, not come to me yet. I just wondered why. No, because I've, you've not uh, flagged up, you've not sent it, Councillor Shelton. I'll come to you in a moment. I'm going to invite Mr. Whittingham, first of all, to deal with the landscaping issue, and then I will come to Councillor Sherrington. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just, I would noticed members are, are concerned about the landscaping and the impact on the adjoining road. Um, and it was just to make members aware that um, certainly for the primary school that was delivered on Chorley New Road in Horwich, uh, there was a requirement to deliver what's called an instant hedge. Um, which does require more maintenance and there would be a, uh, a more definitive um, maintenance requirement on, on the, the, the hedge and the delivery of the hedge. But um, um, rather than uh, the hedge in this instance being delivered um, at, a, at a reduced height and then gradually grow into a 1.5 metre hedge, um, that for an additional cost, that hedge can be delivered as an instant hedge and then maintained at that height with a commitment from the applicant to, to then maintain it at that uh, at that height. Many thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Whittingham. Councillor Sherrington, your request has come through. Sorry about that. I did send it a while ago. I just wondered where I thought everybody was wanting to talk to you, Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, it's a, it's a question to the officers. The thing is that we've got the the uh, the plan of the um, of the planting in our in our uh, bungle, but unfortunately, uh, you can't read what the what the actual plants are. And I was just wondering. I, all I'm wanting to know is about the trees, really, because quite simply, it's all good putting trees there that are going to take forever to grow for an instance and also that are probably going to get hold of the sewage pipes and squeeze them to death or are not going to actually have any leaves on in the winter so we need to have something that's uh, evergreen and probably doesn't have a great uh, huge uh, root system so i could do with uh, finding out of uh, the planners uh, what exactly the trees are that are going in and the number two as well is the fact that you don't have to wait six months years ago you had to wait six months because people put whips in and they were sort of they didn't have a proper a ball at the bottom of them these days everything comes in a huge pot you can plant anything at any time of the year probably not today because today is not a very good day for planting but under normal circumstances any day would be fine and uh, you know you can plant during the winter and all the rest of it and during the summer and there isn't a problem because if you get something that's established enough in a pot there is not going to be a problem and uh, so i do think that six months is too long and i do think that uh, we've had lots of things where they're supposed to have had planting and all the rest of it around them and uh, it's never happened and so i just have concerns about how good the enforcement is going to be on this thank you thank you Mr. Sherrington. you want to respond to anything there uh, mr mansell sure i mean i, I think that the, 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 again the the, the latter the latter part of uh, did, did seem to me to be comment and another thing that's that's fairly reasonable in terms of the question i have just checked uh, i've tried to check what the exact species are I, I can't recall it the exact species what i can tell you is that they aren't evergreen species uh, one of the main reasons for that is that um landscape well, the council's policy and our landscape officers um wants wants us to use uh, you know native species wherever possible um so so they 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 would not be evergreen species uh, but i don't think either were the trees that uh, that were removed from the site either yeah. um, can i come back on that chair because quite simply 
that if we're trying to create a screen, how on earth are we going to create a screen by, say, putting in something like beech or some other cheap old tree along the, you know, along that side? I just don't think it's good enough. I really don't. And I would like to actually, uh, if they've got a planting scheme that they've put in, right, there should be species at the side of each individual thing that they're intending to put in. Obviously, that is not the case. So therefore, it's a bit like, well, anything will go. No. Well, I'm sorry, anything won't go. And I'm not pleased with that. Thank you. No. In, in fairness, Councillor Sherrington, there is a planting schedule defining individual trees, which has been agreed by uh, council policy. Uh, but uh, your comments are noted. That comes to the end of the questions. I'm going to invite, therefore, uh, to open the debate and invite Councillor Ayu as Ward Councillor to uh, open the debate, please. Thank you, Chair. I did uh, pass chat for a question to officers actually, well, probably you missed it. Right. Uh, the question was actually, when does this uh, planting season starts? Does it all? Uh, I'm so, I'm sorry, Chair. I don't, I'm Council. I don't I don't know the answer to that. I'm not knowledgeable enough on planting to uh, to, to to speak to that question. I'm sorry. <clears throat> no problem. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Chair. We always welcome a new business and development in Bolton. Bolton is a very friendly environmental town. On the planning committee, we always. We have learned some lessons on this site regarding tree removal. The main objection on this application are from the residents of Kersley Drive. There were some trees that were removed before the approval of any planning permission. However, these were supposed to remain. My main concern is to protect and address the issue the residents of Kersley Drive have. I have been on the site myself and notice that the landscaping, they have gone right up to the boundary wall. We need some assurance that they will leave about two meters of the land of planting trees and hedges. Lighting is more significant concern for the residents, and I agree with officer's report on paragraph 49. I believe the officers will be able to deal with this matter professionally. I was going to move it a deferment, but due to the current climate and backlog of the applications, as well as the urgency required by the applicant, I want to move it for approval with conditions to be changed. Condition 11 from six months to at least either the completion of development or uh, three months from the completion of development. Uh, I think. Uh, it is uh, actually incomplete application. They're coming in bits and bits, but we are, we are where we are. And I just want to move it for approval with delegation to the officers to sort out the rest of the issues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Ayub. I've had a note that tells me that uh, the uh, best time to plant trees is between October and April and that the Royal Horticulture Society website says that you should avoid planting in waterlogged uh, ground. Uh, thank you for that information, uh, Mr. Allen. Um, second speaker is Councillor Hornby. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would normally totally agree with uh, ward councillors. That's my normal stance. However, uh, with this application, yes, it is um, acceptable, I think, to um, use this particular site for cars. Um, Manchester Road is well noted for the sale of new cars and, and, and old cars, as indeed it is the end of St Peter's Way when you come off there. So I have a problem with that. But I think there needs to be a deferment on this. There are too many concerns with regard to this. If we can get it back to committee within about a month, which I'm sure we can now that we are um, in a position that we are dealing with planning applications once again, we, we should be able to do that. I find it 
rather ironic and strange that when the applicant was questioned with regard to have they had any communication whatsoever with the residents on Kersley Drive who had le legitimate concerns, the answer to that was they've had no communication with them whatsoever. And I think that is appalling. And also the fact that they're using a threat to us that Volvo may well uh, pull out if we don't approve this application today. I don't believe that. We're asking, I'm asking with regard to for a deferment, therefore, so that we can look at legitimate concerns that this committee have got with regard to the lighting, with regard to the boundary treatment. We've all expressed concerns about the boundary treatment. And I think we don't just want to know what tree it is that's going in there or what kind of boundary treatment it is. I think we want diagrams, we want photographs. We want to be able to see what it is that it's going to grow into along that edge to give the residents on Kersley Drive some assurance. And I think that the developer needs to go and speak properly with the residents on Kersley Drive to address their concerns and at least show some interest in the fact that with these people that are going to have to live with this for, for, for quite some time. So I would like to move deferment on this application and, and so we can address some of these issues. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hornby. Uh, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen. OK, thank you, Chair. Sorry about the delay. Um, I have uh, fairly extensive knowledge of this site because I worked there for 18 years um, and I'm well aware of uh, some of the historical concerns of residents on Kersley Drive. Uh, this site has been um, commercial uh, and I suppose industrial for many 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 years. Its last use was by United Utilities. Prior to that it was Norweb the Electricity Board and prior to that, it was Tillotson's, the uh, the printers, long gone now, unfortunately, but uh, they were there for many, many years. So the principle of commercial use is is well, well established. The residents of Kersley Drive for many years when it was an office development had an outlook which was uh, a dwarf wall and then a grass banking which extended right up to the roof level of the offices. Uh, and on top of the offices was car parking, so there was a, a dwarf wall there. So the resident's outlook was a grass bank, basically, with uh, with trees. I am extremely disappointed that the council chose not to take action against the uh, developer for the removal of the trees illegally. I'm disappointed in that. I understand uh, planning officers' reasons for doing it, but I on this occasion, I think they were wrong. Um, the, as I said, the principle of, of commercial development is long, long established. Um, the, the, the main issues, as, as has been uh, brought out in questions, uh, are around the landscaping from Kersley Drive and the lighting. Now, Councillor Hornby suggested that we defer this so that councillors can assess uh, in more detail what these two schemes might be. I have a slightly different view. I'm fairly happy to leave that assessment in the hands of our professional officers. The landscaping is covered by condition 11 and the lighting is covered by condition 13. And I think providing we make it clear to officers that our expectations are that we should have quality landscaping and minimal lighting at night, then I'm happy to leave it with them to uh, to pursue that. So with those issues, uh, Chair, I'm happy to uh, move approval of this application and, uh, and let's get the site developed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Peel. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Yeah, I find myself agreeing, agreeing in entirety uh, with Councillor Allen. Um, I don't see the need for a deferment. I think the only reason members are moving towards deferment is um, some members are having some issues getting ahead around some of the outstanding issues, which we have the ability to resolve here and now via strength and conditions. Um, first of all, the first thing I want to say though about this application is I don't appreciate um, threats being made uh, to this uh, this committee or this planning authority uh, by Volvo. I don't, I don't care how big a company they are. Uh, you don't send emails uh, to members of the committee um, saying you either do as we tell you to do or we will pull out our multi-million pound investment and take it elsewhere. I'm sorry, but the world doesn't work like that uh, and we should uh, take no credence in that whatsoever. Um, there are, uh, with all due respect to the applicants who spoke to us, who then verbally said it again on this meeting, th this threat, there are much better, more grown up and mature ways of influencing the planning committee to try to um, resolve these outstanding issues than making these types of threats. I don't think it does their case any good whatsoever and it should be treated with contempt as should the um, the previous owner's removal of the trees on site. And I too am very disappointed, Chairman, that this was not pursued. I appreciate what Mr Allen said. This new application has allowed uh, the issue to be uh, resolved via some good conditions. But that, with due respect, misses the point. When we um, make it clear uh, in the previous application that these trees are to be protected, um, that was not under interpretation. Uh, and I would like, I would formally ask you, Chair, to uh, to um, dig a bit deeper here with with the head of planning to find out exactly uh, why the the council uh, has rolled over on that particular issue. Again, I appreciate this is not the fault of of Monty, but the but the previous people. Um, it has always been a developed commercial area. Um, it has been vacant for a few years, but it has a long history of various. Um, industries, uh, light industries, uh, commercial industries on this site. So the principle is there. Uh, we have to accept that. Um, but just coming on to the um, the issue, the outstanding issues of the conditions. First of all, condition 13. And when I looked at this condition 13, um, it's very strong actually. It's, it's unusually, uh, with respect to our officers, it is an unusually strong uh, condition for us to put on. Um, all lighting, all lighting shall be switched off outside the permitted operating hours, all lighting, no other lighting shall be installed without written consent. Now I take this as a belt and braces stance by the authority and I will um, commend uh, officers for the strength uh, with which that condition has been written, but I do take it as belt and braces and I think the applicant needs to be aware that that should not be the be all and end all of it. I take the view, uh, I think it might have been Councillor Wilkinson who mentioned this earlier, that we cannot simply just ignore crime uh, issues on, on this site. Um, there's a lot of expensive cars going to be there. And so the idea of having the entire site in, well, what would be pitch blackness uh, throughout um, non opening hours, and especially in the winter months, uh, after, after four o'clock, it's going dark. It is ridiculous, quite frankly. Uh, that condition should be amended to allow for a scheme to be submitted by the applicants for security lighting. The, the amount that they need to secure the site, it need not be obtrusive to residents of Kersley Drive. There are various um, types of lighting systems that can be used uh, to make the site more secure, to help the CTTV cameras uh, as well because they're not always very effective when they just use uh, infrared. Um, and as Councillor Wilkinson said, I'm not talking about big uh, signage, uh, glowing lights shining all over the area. We're talking about a lighting security scheme. So I'd be happy to support the application with that um, that amendment there. On condition um, 14, um, again, um, I, I do find myself in sympathy with what the applicant is asking for. Um, our officers have separated out car sales and service centre, making the service centre uh, opening hours less 
than the car sales, but there's no actual reason there uh, in terms of um, noise pollution that that should be the case. The, the biggest issues is the jet washing, which is inside the facility, and the valeting, which is the furthest you can get away from the houses. They're the, they're the issues that actually cause noise. Um, so I again, I have to have sympathy that condition 13, uh, sorry, condition 14, can uh, have standard opening hours. Uh, that of what what we've put down for car sales should also apply to the service centre. To me, that is not um, an issue that we need to stick our feet in the ground on. Where it would be a little bit tougher would be um, the condition 11 on landscaping. I think members who have spoken on this, they're absolutely right. And I understand the issue of giving applicants six months to do it because of various um, issues of, uh, of when it's best to plant different types of species. And we've had some information passed to us, but I don't understand why it has to be six months from occupation. Um, why can't it be six months from completion? So if we had a condition that said a landscaping scheme must be put in as agreed with the authority six months from completion of the works, that would surely would speed it up because there could be, we don't know, there could, despite what the applicant said, there could be several months delay between completion and occupation. Um, so I hope officers have taken note of what I've said there because I've, 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 um, I've suggested uh, amendments there to condition 13, 14 and 11 uh, that would, um, amendments to condition 14 and 13 actually satisfy, it makes a better scheme from the um, applicant's point of view, but amendments to condition 11 certainly makes a better scheme from the uh, local residents' point of view. Uh, and if that's able to be done, Chair, uh, I would have no problem in seconding Councillor Allen's, uh, Councillor Allen's proposal to move. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peel. Uh, Councillor Darvesh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm happy to support uh, Councillor Allen and Councillor Peel's suggestion. I mean, the way I actually read the application, it was it's a very balanced report. What it's actually doing is trying to support the applicant generate business activity, but at the same time, not kill, not completely killing over. It's left conditions of drainage, lighting, landscaping, the times of opening subject to the business as it continues. So it's maintained that dialogue as well. So I think it's a very balanced report that satisfies everybody. Clearly the applicants not help themselves uh, in the terms of their approach to loss of trees and the fact that they've failed to communicate to the uh, residents of Kersley Drive because they did actually have a rational explanation in terms of the issues with United Utilities. So they failed in that department, but I think it's a very balanced report that opens up, keeps that dialogue going in terms of what the business needs will be in the future. But Council Peel has mentioned some amendments to some conditions, which I guess, I guess helps the applicant actually, rather than coming back. So I'm happy to support that. Thanks, Councillor Vesh. Uh, next uh, speaker I've got listed is Councillor Howarth. Thank you, Chair. I just want to clarify, I did uh, hear uh, Councillor Ayub make a proposal of approval and he wanted, of course, uh, he gave a view on some change to Condition 11, which of course Councillor Peel spoke to as well. He spoke to condition, Councillor Peel spoke to Condition 11, Council, uh, Condition 14 and Condition 13. So uh, I'd be grateful to be guided by you. It, it's as if there were, um, there were there, there was a proposal for approval from Councillor Ayub, then another proposal for approval, unless that is different from almost like a seconding, but I don't want to be rude to Councillor Allen, to Councillor Allen, and it, 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 it may it end up being like that, or am I to pay a bit more attention to it actually being different, Chairman? Uh, thank you, Councillor Howarth. I was going to seek to consolidate the various propositions in a few moments, uh, but I've got Councillor Hornby wishes to speak. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a just a quick one, really. Um, I'm quite happy to withdraw the deferment um, and go along with um, 
those conditions that Council Appeal has put forward. I think it does address the issue, but uh, I, I would just like, even though they're going to address those issues, I would still like uh, at the end of it, once they've been agreed, if uh, as a matter of courtesy, the officers will send round to the committee uh, details of, of, of that scheme as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sherrington, did you wish to speak on this application? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd just like to say that um, I would like to see, because I was actually going to second Sean Hornby's, uh, Council Hornby's deferment, because I would like to see the proper plan of what they intend to do as far as landscaping is concerned, and to so that it can be held up as the way that, the, that everything should look. Because this sort of maybe perhaps about a tree like this and maybe not really. I, I just can't cope with that. I'd, rather, I'd like to know what what they're intending to put in there that they call landscaping. And uh, so I would like to see that even now because I've got I've got places in my ward where they were a wonderful landscaping that was put in as part of planning permissions that I could actually take photographs of it for you now and it's just never never happened and uh, it's just places that are full of weeds so it's uh, I think it's it's very it's very very important especially when you've got uh, houses and businesses uh, sort of cheek on jowl together it just has to be um, something that you 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 think about very very carefully and so, so therefore, I would like, even so, even though I'm going to agree to actually um, approve this, I do uh, wish to have a sight of exactly what is intended, uh, what species and so on that is supposed to be going in there, so that when it comes to the time when they are going to plant, whether it's six months or whether it's when it's the right sort of temperature or whatever that uh, I, I i can actually find out if the enforcement officers are going to make sure that this happens so that that is what i'm asking for to so that uh, i can give this my approval thank you thank you thank you could i ask officers if members are minded to approve it and determined to approve it could we ha circulate, please, the a readable version of the planting schedule on page 50 of the bundle? Yeah, so that members can see exactly what it is uh, proposed there. Uh, yeah, can exactly. I ask, uh, sorry, Mr. Ansel. Could you arrange for that, please? Yeah, certainly, Councillor, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ayu, could I ask, uh, you, you originally proposed the application as it stands. Are you minded to accept the amendments proposed by Council Appeal uh, to become the substantive? Yes, I do, John. I'm OK with the proposition. Thank you very much indeed. It's therefore been moved and seconded uh, that the application be approved with the amendments referred to on paragraphs recommendation 11 13 and 14. Members are voting for or against that proposition. Mrs. Rich. Thanks, Chair. It's it's Helen Gorman again. Um, right. Thank you, Helen. So, um, members, the Chair has outlined exactly um, what the. <laughs> oh, could someone switch off their Can microphone, please? Microphone off, please? Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Councillor Allen? For. Councillor Ayub? For. Councillor Connor? For. Councillor Darvesh? For. Councillor Dean? For. Councillor Howarth? For. Councillor Hayes? For. Councillor Hornby? 
O. Councillor Mystery. Councillor Mystery. Four. Councillor Peel. Four. Councillor Radcliffe. Four. Councillor Sanders. Four. Councillor Sherrington. Councillor Sherrington. Sorry, I'm four. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Waters. Councillor Waters. She's left the meeting, has she? Oh, has she? Sorry, I hadn't noticed that. Apologies. Councillor Wilkinson. Four. And Councillor Wright. Four. So that's 16 in favour. That uh, motion is carried. The application is approved. Thank you, uh, members. We now uh, move to the final application in the bundle. Uh, but before we come to that, I need to check that Mrs. Ridge has got the uh, objector and the uh, supporter online. Chair, I'm just ringing them now. Thank you. We've just a slight delay, Chair, with contacting the objector. Um, Mrs. Ridge is trying again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gorman.
Chair, could you just confirm that we've got the objector and the supporter, please? Thank you. I understand uh, we've got both objector and supporter. Can you? Uh, is that correct, uh, Mrs. Ridge? Sorry, no, Chair. We wanted you to check with the objector and the supporter, just to confirm that they're in. Sorry. So we we should have uh, Mr. Byron and Mr. Ali. Yes, Mr. Mr. Brian here. I am with you. Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali. Chair, I think he may be on mute. Mr. Ali, are you able to hear us? Hello. Uh, Mr. Ali. Hi there. Right, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was in the meeting and then we can yeah, come I'm to the that. item. Right, OK, so the dealing, we're dealing now with the application for 523 and 525 Fodder Lane, which is a retrospective consent to demolition of 523 and the majority of 525 Fodder Lane and the erection of detached two storey dwelling with proposed external alteration to the structure as built, together with hard surfacing within the curtilage and installation of new gates. For so those who have joined the meeting at this point, can I make two observations for your benefit? Members have got the benefit of a late bundle, which includes uh, a response from officers and photographs relating to uh, late objections. And those late objections have been taken into consideration and will be presented uh, by uh, Mr. Allen when he presents his report shortly. And to the note that uh, there was some concern about this being a virtual meeting rather than an actual meeting, uh, unfortunately, under legislation, we're required to hold such a meeting. We can't hold a full public meeting at the present time, but the process that will be followed will be identical to that which would have been followed had we been meeting in the council chamber. And uh, that should give us both transparency and the opportunity for all views to be properly considered. So the application now will be addressed uh, by Mr. Allen, please. Thank you, Chair. Members will be aware that this application was considered at the 5th of December 2019 Planning Committee meeting and was also the subject of an advanced site visit. The application was deferred from the December meeting to enable the applicant to reduce the scale of the proposed rear dormer to closer replicate the previously approved structure. At the previous, at the previous meeting and also as set out in the officer's report, members were taken through how the scheme had evolved from the schemes originally granted permission by officers under de delegated powers in March and July 2018. Whilst the applicant has deviated from the approved plans and demolished a large part of the original house, the previous approvals established the scale, character and relationship with existing properties, including any mitigation which is, which is required. As detailed within the officer's report, Upon instruction from the Council's planning enforcement team, the applicant had ceased work on the proposal. Whilst it is regrettable that the applicant has deviated from the previously approved plans, members will be aware that they must make a decision on whether the proposal in front of them today is acceptable. The applicant has sought to address members' concerns by maintaining the width of the proposed dormer to that previously approved, which is 9.17 metres. They have set, proposed to set back the rear face of the dormer back a further 0.58 metres, i.e. further away from properties on Tigfold Road. The depth of the previously approved dormer was 4.2 metres. As built currently, it is 4.66 metres. And now, as proposed under the current proposal, is 4.28 metres. The height of the dormer's rear face would be would now be 2.442 metres rather than the previously approved 2.44 metres. But as 
I will draw, draw members' attention to on page 76 of the report. Uh, the the picture um, on comparative rear elevation, uh, which if you look closely, it's got the difference between the last approval, the second approval on the site in black, and then it has in a lighter yellowy sh shade of yellow, uh, what is now proposed under the current, pr current proposal before you today. So in, in effect, you'll, you'll see that the width of the dormer, I was looking at it from the rear, is, is the same, um, but the, because the roof has changed in, in, in its dimensions and, and height, um, the dormer itself has, had, has been pushed, pushed um, upward. Office, officer's analysis of this aspect is also detailed within paragraph 38 of the officer's report. Um, the approved the, the approved dormer had a 2.4 meter, 2.44 meter height from roof to slope, roof slope to flat roof, uh, and this is now being reduced by two, well, point, well, two centimeters. Put simply, the previously approved dormer could not be re replicated in an identical position to the to the to that previously approved. Whilst the dormer is slightly taller than previously approved, so uh, in in terms of height. The increased size of the roof, the dormer would appear to be proportionate in relation to the, the, the larger the larger roof, which now is before you for approval. As discussed within the report, in terms of the visual impact of the increased height, the change would have a marginal impact on residents located on Tigfall Road. Office, officers consider, therefore, that the proposed changes to the dormer are acceptable and have in, a, in con conjunction with the applicant have agreed a modified condition which re requires prior to occupation of uh, the dwelling that the dormers of, and the obscured glazing proposed both in the second floor and the first floor windows would be obscurely, lay, obscurely glazed and top opening only. The applicant has also agreed to the to an additional condition um, to allow for the maintenance of the, the existing hedge uh, I'll say when it is supp supp supplemented with the additional planting proposed. The maintenance of the hedge would therefore um, be would be retained and obviously um, rather than the applicant cutting, cutting the trees down uh, you know, within five years of the new planting taking place. In terms of the overall changes to the house as described within the officer's report, Officers consider the proposal as acceptable and is compatible with the character of the wider area. Subject to the provision of obscure glazing, non-opening windows, supplementary tree planting, and the removal of tree permitted development rights, the proposal would be compatible with the surrounding residential dwellings and not result in an unacceptable impact on neighbouring or future occupant amenity, which includes privacy. I just. Finally, I'd just like to draw members to the uh, supplementary information list. If you just bear with me a moment. Um, six, for, further to the report, six additional objection letters have been received from residents along Plotter Lane and Tinkfell Road. Uh, the, the main points are relation more to process in terms of the uh, objection to the online planning committee. I think Councillor Walsh has, has dealt with that a short while ago. Um, also, they, they maintain their ob their objections as, as they have done throughout the process in terms of the building is significantly higher than the existing houses, plans are misleading and the in building incorporates incongruent co coining. The objections also raise previous concerns which are data detailed within the representation section. Um, members will be aware that officers have undertaken a number of rounds of consultation and reconsultation with residents on, on the various aspects of the proposal. I think just in terms of the second page, second page of um, or the third, yeah, the, the two photos shown, you know, whilst um, planning officers are not experts in uh, photography, I think the first photo is there to just to show the relationship of the eaves level with the adjoining property. Uh, and the second picture is also there to show 
ex you know, the, the coining as built on site and also how it relates to the, the neighbouring property. Obviously, me members will note, so obviously, there is the, some coin detail is uh, on number 527, but obviously, it's very different in its um, the materials used. Just in terms of, I think there's a, some additional points that were raised at the last committee meeting, uh, which were in the bullet points below. Um, in terms of whether the foundations have been checked, um, and I can confirm that the council's bill and control section have been out and have approved uh, the foundations as, as built. Uh, reference is also made in paragraph 43 of the officer's reports. There have been no main room windows in the rear of the property. This is referring to the application site, the host property, and not properties on Tigfold Road. Officers will. Um, agree that the, there are main room windows bedrooms uh, at first floor level in, in, in the properties which overlook it on Tigfall Road. Uh, the proposed dormer size is yep, a, a fully assessed at paragraph 38. Um, and to clarify, the proposed plans do show three, three out of five of the windows in the proposed rear elevation to be obscurely glazed with windows in the side elevation also to be obscurely glazed. I'd just like to make members uh, draw members attention to um, whilst the plans do show the side elevate I think it's a study window and a bedroom window in the two side elevations uh, as such obscurely glazed it, it is referenced within the report that I think that technically from from the planning office perspective we don't require those windows to be obscurely glazed uh, which is why we haven't conditioned condition that uh, but obviously if members wish to, to have those condition uh, those con those obscurely glazed, we can add that condition on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, at this point, uh, Councillor Coward has declared an interest and will withdraw from the Planning Committee, but will now speak as a ward councillor before she withdraws from the meeting. But, Councillor Howarth, you have got five minutes to address the committee, please. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I request that um, planning members uh, consider the material matter of size and scale today regarding this application 065519. A standout issue on size and scale is the roof and the dormer. Paragraph 38 in today's report informs that the height of the dormer is increased but is now proportionate with the increase in overall roof height and width. A backlash grew about the development as nearby residents saw the roof and dormer height increase and uh, saw more windows. It was a building growing and changing without permissions and this then has raised more objection in the area. Further on in today's report it states that there is similar roof and dormer in the area but well, I say this is more about design than about actual size and scale of a roof or dormer. Uh, the roof and the dormer are large for the area as it has increased in 06551 application. In an email I received in recent days uh, sent to planning members, I believe, there is a photograph that shows the dormer already built above the current roof line. This is amidst scaffolding as the building is paused. In application uh, 03579 stroke 18, the dormer is in a diagram and shown set below the roof ridge. So that's on a diagram on the email. Next to it is 06551 diagram. The dormer is higher and also in real life in the photograph, it does look higher still. Um, on the recent email diagram, uh, when you look at 03579 versus 06551 of the dormer and the roof mass, um, today's um, diagram does look uh, to the common man 15% bigger, including height. A number of residents have looked at the planning application online. Others have also considered size and scale in terms of what it looks like visually, the property, and on the diagram shown in the email that, that they've seen in the area. The roof, roof and dormer are a main issue to size and scale. The build actually itself does look around 15 to 20% bigger than that of what was approved. 
No one uh, envisaged at all that height, width or depth of the whole property was going to increase from those permissions given in 03579. There are residents mentioned in the report whom it was felt were objecting to 03579, but it's more nuanced for some, i.e. that they were objecting about, pre objecting about previous matters in, in this application. It's the residents that were taken aback uh, that the build had gone above permissions and started to look taller with different windows. There was that plan for a balcony. It's that really uh, that's caused the stronger views of we ought to have objected before. I have had much uh, contact from residents in that part of Plodder Lane and in 2018 with uh, 80 uh, to 100 at a meeting over Holland's land. And when some residents were not familiar at all with the council online reporting page uh, for planning, when they had started to have concerns about this, about this building, particularly the height of this building, I raised the planning enforcement matter 523525 Plodder Lane myself as ward councillor because they were struggling to, people were struggling to use the systems that we've got. Condition two on this application pertains to trees. I'm, I'm not sure that hedge going in will mitigate the issue of this privacy matter. Paragraphs 47 and 49 in the committee report discusses the privacy matters with the home on Tigfold Road and the trees at this site. The current tall conifers provide the privacy aspect presently. If the landscaping plan additional trees are not of this height or hedge, then if the current conifers get removed, the tree height would be lost. Condition two would need to be strengthened in the future to prevent this occurrence of a gap of tall trees because of the windows and the privacy. And how, how can that be achieved if you can't have a, a tree protection order? So to conclude, size and scale are the material issue. Uh, recall that photograph of the roof and the dormer in the email. Recall the front view diagram of the differences uh, of, uh, of roof and dormer on 03579 and 06551. Also the building itself, height, width, depth, looking increased by a percentage overall. And I find that this extra volume, scale, size and brick has not been, uh, it's not appeared to be possible to mitigate on this hard build, I'm afraid, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Howarth. You've just about met your five minute target. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Howarth will now withdraw from the meeting uh, so as not to uh, be prejudicial in any future votes in accordance with the protocol. We now turn to uh, a representative for the objectors, Mr. Gary Bryan. Mr. Bryan, you have three, three minutes to address the meeting and then uh, the requirement to take any questions from members of the committee. So you've got Thank three you, minutes, sir. please. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can indeed, thank you. Okay, we object to this application and ask that it be refused. The application is for retrospective planning permission for the developers to be allowed to return the work so far, as they, for whatever reasons, fail to adhere to the earlier plans that were approved. We object to the retention of the current style of bare windows with brick pillars or mullions. Despite it being implied at the previous committee meeting, this style of window has not been approved previously, and that's confirmed in the current planning officer's most recent report at Para 5. It is our view they are not in keeping with the style of the other houses in the area. We submit that the retention of the addition to the building's dimensions above what was previously approved should also be refused. The building as it stands is some 0.62 metres wider, 0.53 deeper and 0.5 taller than that depicted on approved plans. As again quoted in the planning officer's report, where he suggests they are minimal. The fact is, is the increase of length and depth had some 17 square metres of area to both the ground and first floors allowing what was originally planned and approved of a four to five bedroomed house to now become a six to seven bedroomed house. It may seem trivial to argue about these differences on length and depth and height, but this makes what would already have been a very large building even larger, with the visual impact of overpowering and intimidating those homes which surround it. The effect of domination and overpowering is such that the people who live to the side and rear can no longer enjoy sitting in their respective gardens. Thereby, the scale of this building diminishes their quality of life and anything that can be done to reduce this effect should be done. Interface distance between this building and the houses on Tinkfold Road should be in regulations causing quarter to regulation 21 metres. On a previous application that was approved, 
to allow this distance to be reduced to a minimum of 18.75 metres. With the extra depth to the current build, this has increased further to 18.22. The planning officer at Para 43 in his report refers to the definition of principal rooms, adding that the first floor rear bedrooms of the houses in Tigfield Road do not qualify, as they are not the two largest bedrooms. We submit and maintain that as these houses on Tigfield Road are two bedroomed houses, then by default, those rear bedrooms have to be principal rooms. So even though reducing the build back to the approved dimensions will not reinstate the full 21 metres interface, any steps to uh, increase the distance from its current 18.22 has to be a positive step. The residents of 28 Tigfold are particularly concerned as in their case, that rear bedroom is a children's bedroom for two children under 10. And their concerns are around the privacy of those children and believe this could amount to a safeguarding issue. Something that I'm sure you would agree everybody should be concerned about. The Dormer has also been built larger than was previously approved, adding to the overall size of the building. We submit that the Dormer's dimensions should be returned back to those dimensions that were previously approved. The planning officer goes on into great length in his report quoting a number of dimensions and says the Dormer falls below the ridge, where visually, at the moment, the Dormer is taller, Dormer, sorry, is taller than the ridge. The fact remains the Dormer is larger and it should be, uh, than it should be and the retention of its current dimension should not be approved. There are a number of discrepancies between what the planning officer says in his report and what appears on the most recent three sets of plan available for us to look at. Dated the 24th of Feb this year, 20th of January this year and 20th of December last. The most concerning and most important is the comments regarding glazing. In paragraph 8 of the report, he states that the rear windows of the roof extension are to be glazed with obscure glass level 5, up to a point 1.6 metres above the finished floor flesh level, etc. Yet on the most recent two sets of plans, the windows are shown as three panels with top openers. And the annotation for these windows clearly says, windows to be obscured glazed up to 1.6 metres from FFL. Mr. Ryan, can we three minutes, please? Can you okay, stay up, please, for your three minutes? Okay, so uh, in conclusion, we ask that this application for the retention of work dates to be refused. The bill should be returned to its approved dimensions. The door included, the style of the bay windows should be amended so they match more closely those around it. However, if approval is granted, we ask that conditions are applied to protect the privacy of those houses that surround it. In particular, the glazing of the dormer to be obscure glass in entirety with, with top Thank holders you. and the maintenance and upgrade of the trees and bushes that currently grow at the rear boundary. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just for the record, can I also have recorded that Councillor Sanders, who declared an interest in this item, has withdrawn from the meeting and set the meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bryan, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we now have um, questions from members. And Councillor Hornby, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, three minutes is not a long time to give your objections to an application. So luckily, these two questions that I've got for you will give you the opportunity just to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, question one is, I'd just like you to explain a little bit more about your concerns about the principal windows and the privacy. Uh, and the other question is in relation to uh, the this current application and, and where we've got to and how many times in the past has uh, these, these applications been for us and totally ignored and just gone away and built what we want. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, in a relation to your question regarding the privacy um, matter of things, um, it's the fact that a previous planning application that was approved allowed this interference, uh, interfere, sorry, interface gap between those that the new building the house on Tigfold Road to be reduced below the recommended 21 metres. Um, we are concerned that that was allowed to go through in the first place, but we accept that it was approved. However, the increase in the uh, the projection of the rear wall, rearwards of this new build, has reduced that gap even further. Um, and it's our submission that by returning it back to the approved dimensions, it will at least give some of that gap back. We do have concerns that because of the, beha the previous behaviour of the uh, developer to basically do what they want, that the annotations on the current plans available for us to view do not reflect what the actual planning office says in his report. Um, and basically, that is that on the plans, it says that the windows to be obscure glazed up to 1.6 metres from FFL, that's finished floor level, with the two side panels to be clear, top opening and central panel to be obscure. That sounds rather weird when the planning office is saying that all windows in the dormer should be uh, obscure. 
Uh, as I do say, the occupants are number 28. Um, during other conversations, I expect, uh, 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 sorry, uh, put forward their con concerns that this rear bedroom in their house which as they are only two bedroom houses, therefore by definition it has to be a principal room because it, the principal rooms are the two largest bedrooms in the house. If you've only got two, then it's got to be. Uh, it's their child's bedroom or their children's bedroom, both of you are under 10. And it's their concerns and they do feel it's a safeguarding issue there. Uh, as regards your second question, sir, I, you broke up a little bit because I, I am listening in on the phone. Um, from what I understand, you were asking that um, how many times have things been objected to and nothing appears to have happened. Um, there's quite a number of things that have been applied and changed and the developer just appears to be really take no notice whatsoever of what the planning department have instructed in the past. And it's our concerns that once again, if this goes through with, with some uh, stringent uh, changes or conditions, they won't apply, they won't apply them. Well, thank you very much. I have no further indication of questions uh, to the objector. So thank you, Mr. Uh, Brian, for your presentation. We come then to Mr. Ali, who is speaking on behalf of the applicant, or is the applicant, sorry. You also have got three minutes to address the meeting and then take any questions from members. Mr. Ali, please. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, thank you, yes. I'll keep it brief and just summarise. As we all know, um, the case was um, brought forward in December, so it's pretty much the same objections and the same case. Um, leading on to the, on from that, um, the application has been submitted. Changes have been made to the dorm. A duplicate balcony doors have been removed. Um, other than that, um, for the privacy issues, uh, where it is for the tree. Um, a discussion was made uh, with the planning officer and, and I've come to agree that I would uh, willingly um, put a conditional increase so later on in the future I am not able to cut the trees other than maintain them, uh, whether it's the height or how wide they grow. Um, also additional to that, I've, um, I did mention to the officers that I would put in additional trees to cover the privacy. Um, also, on from that, um, the objectors bring up the issue of number 29 and the rear bedroom being for children and the privacy issue. Um, that actually did us a favour by putting up the picture up on Bolton News. Um, I did forward it to the officer. I did ask him to put it onto the system so everyone was uh, able to see it. From what is visible, no bedroom win windows are an issue. The only issue we have is the bathroom windows, which is obviously going to be obscured anyway. Um, Dormer windows are going to be obscured from full finished flow to 1.6 up, so that's not an issue either. Um, the other issue about the, the um, bedroom windows, I are willingly, um, from the last meeting, it was just mentioned about the dormer, but I've willingly put in um, to put in obscure windows on the first floor. Um, yes, they've opted in. Uh, we come to an agreement to do one window in each bedroom because it was, well, it was said that only one window would be the problem. So only one window is obscured and the other one is a fire escape window, which is going to be clear and glazing. Um, other than that, I've pretty much addressed all the issues in the plant and I'll go on to questions if there is any, um, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, questions therefore to Mr. Ali. Uh, first question from Councillor Hornby. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, yeah, Mr. Ali, um, there are serious concerns with this application and have been um, in the past. What assurances have we got this time that you will keep to the planning application? Has it at is if it is approved, and you're not going to alleviate beyond it uh, even further. Thank you. Um, I'm a reasonable individual. I'm not going to throw the blame on anyone, um, and I'm not going to throw allegations around that due to ethnicity. Someone's in favour. I've put in the recommendations to willingly support my case and to help the residents around me. Um, where it is for their case about privacy for the children, I'll later on go on to have children as well and they play in the garden, wherever it is. I've got to worry about 
the privacy of their life as well. Um, but I trust my neighbours. I'm not one of them. One of them neighbours that would criticise one. So where it is for the full case, I'm willing to follow the full application, which is why I've proposed what I've proposed. Um, other than that, if you've got any questions. Uh, yes, you. Can I just come back on that, please? Yes, certainly, Councillor Hornby. The point I'm making is that when this application has been approved in the past, you have not stuck to the planning application as approved and you've literally built whatever you've wanted to build. Thank you. Chair, Chair, can I just ask um, you to pause the meeting for a moment? Unfortunately, our presenters laptop has had some technical difficulties and we may not be broadcasting live so if we could just pause right. for a moment and we'll start again as soon as we can thank you for that Apologies for the interruption, Chair. Uh, the broadcast does appear to have continued. Um, the timer hasn't stopped. So as far as I'm aware, we can carry on from where we left off. Fine. Thank you. Right, sorry, the... Uh... Am I okay to continue? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the, the point I was making or trying to make, which uh, I don't think you've answered, is that on previous applications that have been approved by this committee, you have not followed the application that you've had approved and we've had to take enforcement against you. What guarantee have we got this time that you will stick to an application that's approved or we're going to have to get enforcement out again in the future? Thank you. Um, yeah, I take that. Um, on previous applications, it was pretty much everybody got about the day, went to work, whatever it was, and turned up in the evening just to check the progress. Um, but now, having known the issues that have been raised, I will make sure I'm there on a daily basis. Um, if I have to leave work, I will. And I'll see the construction through till the end and make sure everything done, everything is done according to the application. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Uh, Councillor Sherrington, did you have a question? Yes, Chair, yes. Uh, can I speak to Mr. Ali? Yes. yes. Hello, Mr. Yes. Ali. Um, I, what I'm ringing up, am I through? Am I through there, Chair? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Continue, please. Can I just uh, ask a question regarding, obviously, when you had your foundations done, you would have got uh, building regs in to check whether they were all right. And I presume you would have got a certificate to say that they are all right. Um, can I ask then why the, the person from building regs didn't bother to measure the fact that your foundations weren't as part of uh, the uh, what was agreed at the planning committee. In other words, they, they were quite considerably larger. And uh, I would like to know, I uh, would you feel happy about your foundations? Because if he'd actually done the foundation size wrong, 
as in width and in so on, uh, width and height and so on. I would be worried about the depth of whether they're all right or not. So I'm asking you whether you've got a certificate for uh, the, the fact that they should be giving you uh, to say that it's all right for you to continue uh, building on that site. Um, I didn't receive a certificate. Um, I don't know whether my architect or the council hold that certificate. Um, he seemed very experienced, the chat that came out, so I don't know whether he's just done it from the eye, but when the foundations were dug, the word dug to measurement, um, that's when the chat came out, had a look, and left giving us approval to continue work. Um, I don't know whether... That uh, can I just them. ask then, did you not employ them direct then? Where did they come from the council? Yeah, just, just, yeah, can I just come in on that one? Because is it not the case that building surveyors and, uh, do not actually check the dimensions, they check the uh, depth? Could an officer please just respond to that one? That's a technical question. Yeah, Mr. I Ballard. mean, the... Oh, yep, sorry. Thanks, councillor. Yeah, just yeah. I think yeah, councillor Allen is is correct. You know, billing control officers do not check um, whether the dimensions are correct in terms of the plan the planning drawings. They will just look at whether a foundation is acceptable in terms of it. Obviously, it's on solid strata, etc. Um, yeah. So I think that answers your question. I think in terms of the councillor Sherrington's point about the can the whether they get a, a notice saying the foundations are fine. Usually the way it works is that billing surveyors will look at put a note on their they have uh, site notes that they put onto the system. So that will say your know, foundations approved. Uh, I don't know November 2016 or whatever, and and then they they won't provide. Um, the provider completion notice at the end rather than approving each individual aspect of a proposal. Thank you. OK, thank you. We're so, so it's, can I just say, Chair, that this is probably an area that needs to be looked at well, nationally? I'm sorry. Thank you. We're, dealing with questions, we're dealing with questions of the applicant at the moment. That's a policy issue. We'll take that one separately, please, if we could. Questions to uh, the applicant. Uh, the uh, next um, person I've got is uh, Councillor Peel. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, it's a very quick, simple question to Mr. Alley. Um, going back to the earlier answer he gave to Councillor Hornby, uh, he said uh, if this application goes through, he can reassure us that even if it means leaving work early, he'll keep on top of it and make sure everything's um, uh, above board. I read from that, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Alley, that the people that you employed to do the work on this building basically just went off and did their own thing without informing you so you you would you would return home from from work on various days and um just assume everything was going okay because obviously you weren't measuring it on a daily basis do you have any explanation as to why the people you employed actually just chose to do something completely different um, I wouldn't say the chose to do something completely different. Um, a lot of bricklayers follow the straight lines, and if certain foundations ain't laid straight for them, um, they wouldn't take time out themselves to correct the foundations. They just continue work from what I've learned. Um, other than that, for myself, yeah, as an owner of the property, I just I'm paying someone's uh, wage, so I'm leaving them to get on with the work and turn up in the evening and expect the job to be done and just to watch progress. But now, um, knowing the issues, knowing the complaints, I will stay on top of it. Thank you. Councillor Ayu, you had a question to Mr. Ali? Councillor Ayu? Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, my question has actually been answered. I was, my question was that uh, uh, the building inspector, was it from Bolton Council or did you hire a private inspector? I believe it was from Bolton Council. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Those are all the questions I've got noted for Mr. Ali. Thank you, Mr. Ali, for uh, your presentation and for taking the questions. I, no come then to, uh, I come then to questions to officers. Uh, Councillor Darvesh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, it's a question to the officers, uh, Alex. Uh, uh, Alex, um, it's something that I picked up on. Uh, I was at the uh, last meeting actually in uh, December, but I didn't pick up on this fact. If we go to the pages and we look at page 73 and 74 and 75, I mean, uh, the fact that this applicant has actually demolished uh, a substantial amount of the building basically means that what actually it says on page 73, which is the original approval and the second approval, those approvals are actually not valid, are they? So, you know, we're almost comparing the current proposal to the original pair of houses. I mean, that's my understanding. And is that is that correct? Because um, the way we're looking at this application, we're almost saying that the second approval is actually has been granted uh, and therefore we're comparing how big this property is compared to the second approval. I get it that, you know, he, the, the massing could be similar to the second approval, but the truth is there is actually no planning application live with this application, is there? The, the, the applicant doesn't actually have anything, does it? Mr. Allen. Apologies, Councillor. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Darvesh. Uh, so in terms of um, when we consulted neighbours on the current proposal the first time, uh, the application was described as an amendment to the previous approval. And I think you, you are correct, Councillor, that, you know, that the, the two previous approvals are, are a material consideration. Um, in terms of the scale, um, you know, design, etc., of what what's previously been approved, um, but obviously the the current application is, is a is a different uh, beast, as it were, in terms of because uh, we have reconsulted because a large part of the property, the existing original dwellings, as you can see at the top of the page, were were demolished, and um, and there was only a relatively small amount of the original house that was retained. Uh, so we have we have taken that on board. Uh, and change the description of the application as it appear, now appears for members. Um, so yeah, what, whilst I suppose technically because they've demolished a large part of the building, the original building, they could not implement the fir either the first or the second approval. Um, you know, we, we're, we have, to, well members will have to consider whether the increase in scale is appropriate, but they have to bear in mind that what's gone on before in terms of how theoretically that the original house or two houses has has got consent for um, extensions which substantially increase the scale you know with uh, height etc of, of the property thank you thank you councillor hornby <clears throat> thank you uh, chairman uh, yeah, Alex, I'm just curious, uh, from the original building as it was before anything started and throughout the applications, including this one, what has been the percentage increases in volume uh, of, of this building? So I, can just, I just want to get a rough I idea in my head. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anywhere in the report, the reports, I can't see it, see it certainly, in, uh, and obviously members have had the report as well, which explains, you know, the proportionate increase. Um, obviously, if you if you were going for looking at a house extension, um, you would, obviously policy dictates that house extensions to an existing house or houses should be subordinate to the original house. 
obviously now, as I say, we're, we've got a different beast. With they're applying for a new dwelling, so that therefore, when you're looking at a new dwelling, you look at obviously the, the size of the plots. Obviously, how, does it fit in with the, the, the wider area character, etc. Um, so I, I know that doesn't really answer your que question, um, but I mean, I think the the, the ev evolution of the house from what it was to um, to what it is now it is clear is clearly shown on on pages you know page, on the, page 73 in terms of the front elevation so oh sorry yeah the the front no that's the rear elevation sorry um so yeah so that, so to show how it has evolved um i mean roughly speaking looking at page 72 in terms of the front elevation um i suppose in terms of the the, the blue line obviously to the left of the property signifies how how much it has got wider from the original so i'd say probably i don't know it's probably extended maybe by a roughly by a half third to a half approximately but obviously members are can make their own assessment of uh, of that themselves really thank you those are all the questions that uh, we have uh, I've now got um, you know, the debate, and I've got uh, a number of members have indicated. I'm beginning with Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't speak for long, uh, but I've got a problem with retrospective applications. And I've always thought we were looking at a principle here where we considered it just as we would with a new application. In other words, if it's not suitable, we turn it down and don't take any notice of the fact that it's already been built, if that's the case. And I think that's what we should do with this, this particular application. Now, when we get people who can't build to the approved plans, to me, that's either a matter of incompetence or a matter of trying something on. I think every member will have to make their own mind up what this might be, but I tend to be influenced by the fact that if it's always bigger than the original approved plans, it may be the latter rather than the former, because building it bigger will cost more as well. It'll cost the, the brickies more, it'll cost the agent more, it'll cost the, uh, the, the, the applicant more. So I, I have, as I say, real problems with this. Now, looking at it from the merits of the building, I think the big problem I have, and you talk about coins, you talk about glazing, they're all relevant factors. But to me, this is less than 21 metres away from the houses at the rear. And that is compounded by the fact that there is a drop in level between this house and the houses at the rear. So very clearly in my mind, I think we should be turning this down chair and i'd like to move refusal because of the massing the effect on the residents and the effect on the privacy of the residents and that's all i want to say on it uh, thank you uh, councillor hayes uh, councillor allen <clears throat> thank you chair uh, I'm glad that Councillor Hayes uh, said what he did um, because it is a fact that when we have these discrepancies, let's call them, they do always seem to be bigger than was approved. Um, but uh, as Councillor Hayes rightly says, members will need to make their own minds up on that. Um, I have an aversion to uh, schemes and projects which are built differently from what was approved. I find that there is no excuse whatever to build a house which is half a metre taller, half a metre wider. There is no excuse at all. Um, builders are not that incompetent. Even the most amateurish builder possesses a tape measure. Uh, and so I find that there's no excuse whatsoever. And so I tend to err on the side that it's probably a deliberate con. Um, I'm going to second, I think Councillor Hayes moved refusal, I'm going to second refusal. Um, one of my okay. main concerns is the rear dormer. 
And I'm really glad that Councillor Howarth also spotted the flaw in uh, in the applicant's uh, justification for this. The, he's reduced, we, let, let's just go back to why we deferred the application before. One of the reasons we deferred it was to give the applicant an opportunity to reduce the scale of the door. So he comes back to us and says he's done that. And indeed he has marginally. But the fact that the ridge height is half a metre taller than was approved means that the roof of the dormer is also half a metre higher above finished floor level than was approved. So the dormer might be physically smaller, but it is higher up. And that's a significant variance. We've also heard from, uh, from the objector that the increase in the depth and the width of the property means that it's something in the order of 17 square metres bigger, which as the objector quite rightly says is another room. So this house is significantly bigger than, than was approved. Uh, in my view, the applicant has failed to address the reasons that we deferred the application last time. And so I'm going to uh, second refusal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Hornby. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm of the opinion also that this application should be refused. Um, he was given ample opportunity in the past to put this right. But, you know, anybody that drives up and down Plodder Lane and looks at this house, it is totally out of keeping on that part of, of Plodder Lane. It does not fit in at all. I don't believe when he said he hadn't got a clue that this house was being built way beyond what he'd got planning permission for in the past. The application has been milked all the way through. He's ignored all the way through everything to do with this application. And I think we owe it to these residents at the back, as and I don't accept, it's a two bedroom houses these on Tigfold. Their principal windows should be the back window as well with regard to uh, the bedroom. They've only got two bedrooms. They have serious concerns with regard to that. And as for um, the comments with regard to um, the inspectors that were coming round, I find it unbelievable that the applicant uh, was not aware of what was going on. The inspector, I find it very hard to believe, would not know that that is not being built to what was done as well. So with all those in mind, and I think that Councillor Allen and Councillor Hayes summed it up perfectly with regard to it. So I'm happy to also go with refusal on this application. Thank you, Councillor Hornby. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I've um, I've listened to the uh, what Councillor Hayes, Councillor Allen, Councillor Hornby have said quite carefully, um, and I'm somewhat surprised that we already had this debate in December um, in the committee, and we came up uh, with a number of issues we highlighted that we wanted the applicant to go back and look at. Um, there's been extensive consultation with um, on this um, application and quite rightly so. I think it definitely has been one of the uh, more difficult um, applications uh, that we've looked at in recent times and uh, it has been a difficult time for everybody involved, um, including the residents and I would say somewhat the applicants as well. Um, we had an we had an extensive discussion in the December committee. Um, the committee came up with a decision. We asked the applicant applicant to carry out a number of significant uh, changes, including to the dormer 
and uh, to the to the to the windows. Uh, revised plans show that this application shows those changes have been made. Uh, the objections that we've received on this application are not dissimilar to the last application we uh, we saw. And um, those, as I said, those discussions have already taken place. I think there are certainly lessons um, to be learned from uh, from this application for everybody involved. Um, I think their officer, I think our officers have uh, played a very important role in this um, and have been very sensible. So on this occasion, I'm going to follow the officer's recommendation and uh, move approval of the scheme. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Deed. Councillor Darvesh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to point to page 77, actually, and this is the point I was trying to make in terms of my questions to Alex. Um, page 77 gives you a good idea in terms of what the original building, the original pair of houses actually looked like, and the new building. That's actually what, we're, what the applicant is applying for retrospective permission for. Now, because there is no other valid application in between. So what in effect we're looking at is the size of the building today compared to the original pair of semis. And for me, it is most definitely um, not in keeping with the surrounding area in terms of si size and scale. So I'll be supporting the refusal as well. Thanks for coming, Councillor Davish. Councillor Ayu. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I have listened all the debate very carefully. I read the complaints report as well. This application was last considered in December 2019 and was deferred with some recommendation. The applicant has followed the suggestion of, of members and sought to reduce the depth of the dormo by pushing the facing elevation of Dormo further away from Thinkford Road. I don't think applicant went over the line intentionally. It was probably a mistake by the builder. The applicant would gain nothing from it. After the complaint, the applicant should top the construction work when asked by the enforcement team. It has not yet resumed. Within the investigation, it was picked up that uh, house is marginally over in size. I have read the official report, which is very comprehensive. But I don't want to go over what has already been said. Since the meeting in December, I think the officers have managed the reduction much more than the member have asked for. Uh, therefore, I would uh, be seconding the approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Uh, Councillor Sherrington, did you wish to speak uh, in the debate or were you, when you put speak earlier, was that for a question? Sorry, or, I, uh, I, I have no wish to speak. I, I've made my mind up actually, so it's fine. Thank you. I have no further indications of the speakers. Councillor Allen, I want to come in. Sorry. Councillor Mystery, I've not, uh, sorry, I've not seen you on the list, but yes, Councillor okay, yeah. Mystery. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I've listened to all the arguments and all the previous uh, decision making process. What, what this application actually was uh, approved under delegated powers, and then we both sue and myself we were not consulted over this by the planning authority but i think the residents in the area are up in arms over what has happened but then what what we need to do look at it is this application is going to be looked on its merit and what is before us the view i take is that we are not here to punish the applicant our job is to try and find a solution to this now which is acceptable to the objectors as well as to the applicant. Uh, 
the only thing I can say to the applicant that he has needs to learn and those who ever apply in the future need to know they stick to the planning applications and what they've got and build to that. Of course, because of lack of control, really, that they get away with this. On this particular one, my view is after having listened uh, to the objector, he said if we were minded to approve it, he wants the applicant tied to the conditions that we're going to put into this if we, we were minded to approve it. Uh, and again, I want to see this thing finished because it's on main route to the hospital coming from the motorway. Uh, it's been there for 12 months. I live in the ward. I'm in contact with people all the time. And this particular application needs to be resolved quickly. What I can see from now is if we do say no, he's going to appeal against it. And this is going to carry on. And we, we think we're going to be in the same situation as those houses, the multi million pound houses on Charlie Old Road, about to be this way. So I'm of the view that although the residents are not going to like what I've said, but it is in the interest of everybody around that we, we bring this matter to a conclusion. And I, as a ward councillor, would like to see it approved. So I'll make, I'll, 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 support, I'll support approval. Thank you very much indeed. I have no further indications. The proposal was that the application should be refused. So we will now come to the vote and members are voting for or against the refusal. If you wish to refuse the application, you vote for. If you wish to support the application, you vote against. Mrs. Gorman. Sorry, I'm confusing you. It's now Cambridge again. Come back. Alan? Oh. Councillor Ayo? Against. Councillor Connor? Against. Councillor Darvish? For. Councillor Dean? Against. Councillor Hayes? For. Councillor Hornby? For. Councillor Mistry? Against. Councillor Peel. Against. Councillor Radcliffe. Councillor Radcliffe. Against. Councillor Sherrington. Councillor Sherrington. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, against. Councillor Walsh. For. Councillor Waters. Sorry, it's no longer with us. Councillor Wilkinson. For. Councillor Wright. For. That is. That is. Just bear with us one minute, Chair. Thank you. <sighs> Sorry about that. The vote is 7-4, seven, 7 against. So the Chair has a casting vote. I voted for refusal and I therefore cast my vote in favour of refusal. Thank you. That uh, deals with the whole of the applications this afternoon. Can I thank members uh, for your support and attendance? Um, I think we've all learned a lot uh, further about the process and hopefully next time will be even smoother. But thank you very much indeed uh, for attending this afternoon. I declare the meeting closed.